Hello everyone, my name is Lexi Hain. I am an assistant research professor at the University of Connecticut. And today I'm presenting the work from my research with Arash Zaghi. And this is on the learnings from the field implementation of a novel UHPC beam end repair on a corroded steel girder bridge in Connecticut. So first I wanted to provide some background on why we're focused on the repair of steel bridges with corrosion damage. And if you're from particularly the nor Northeast, this is a problem that you're well acquainted with, is that when we have simple span beams and deck joints, we get leaking of water and de-icing salts, and that results in severe corrosion damage at the ends of these beams. This corrosion damage results in losses in bearing capacity, and then the need to repair these beams. And this is an incredibly costly issue. The U.S. spends over $8 billion annually to repair and replace corrosion damage on bridges. So what we were focused on at the University of Connecticut in partnership with the Connecticut Department of Transportation was coming up with a more cost-effective, easy-to-implement design for the repair of these beam ends. I'm going to provide an overview of the repair. Here we have the our beam ends with corrosion damage at the location of our joint. What we do then is we weld headed shear studs on the intact portion of the web. This is important. We're able to completely bypass that corroded region. We then encase it in ultra high performance concrete and this generates an alternate load path. So we're able to completely bypass that. The load is transferred through the studs to the UHPC and down to the pier. This repair is something that we've been working on for quite some time for the first phase that was started in 2013 and that was a proof of concept where we worked on experiments on third scale girder specimens and did finite element modeling to show the structural viability of the design. In the second phase, we moved on to being able to quantify the stud capacity so we'd be able to design this repair and also doing experimental studies on full scale plate girder repairs. What I'm presenting today is our third phase, which is the field implementation of the repair on 45 beams on a bridge in New Haven, Connecticut. And along with this, we also did instrumentation. And that helped us to be able to look at the results from the field implementation and compare those to our experimental results to make sure that the repair was activated and performing as designed. So today I'm going to be mainly focused on our field implementation, the process and the results. And first I want to provide an overview of the bridge. This repair was selected for a variety of reasons and most of them came down to the traditional repairs were just not well suited. This was a challenging bridge. It was over Amtrak. So we had both freight rail and electrified rail lines which severely limited our access. The bridge was also skewed, which added complexity, and there were variable beam sizes. So this was not a standard design. We had uh, different skews at each pier. We had different bearing designs, some locations with bearing stiffeners, some without. That really added complexity to the, these individual designs. The first step in the repair was cleaning the ends, so being able to get all of the built-up corrosion off working with a plain steel surface. Here, this is important, so we're able to see the level of corrosion, and then also so we're able to shoot the studs on. One of the things that we have to be really careful about when we're applying these studs is making sure that we're getting a complete weld collar. The design of the repair was based on a full weld collar and we actually get additional capacity from the studs from this weld collar. So it's really important to make sure that we have the complete weld so the repairs are performing as designed. The next step in the repair process was installing our instrumentation. We used a variety of different sensors in order to capture the performance of the beams. This included foil strain gauges on the web and on the studs. We also included concrete strain gauges to measure the strain in the UHPC panel. We included a slip transducer to measure the difference 
in the displacement of the web of the beam and the UHPC panel. This, from our experiments, is how we quantified how much movement was occurring, how much our studs were deforming, and we would have load-slip relationships for the capacity of the studs. And we also included accelerometers, thermometers to measure the heating of the UHPC panel, and concrete transducers that captured the strength gain of that material. For this, we had two NEMA enclosures that housed our data acquisition systems that we were able to access using Wi-Fi. These two units sat on top of the piers for about six months. After the instrumentation was installed at the four ends that we were monitoring, we moved on to forming. The first step in forming was fitting the form and then taking it back out, then applying the sealant, and then locking it into place. Once the forms were applied, the UHPC filled the forms using a PVC distribution system. We cored holes through the deck, and the UHPC was passed through those core holes, filled the PVC form, and into the plywood forms beyond. This was a method that was tested during a mock-up, which was critical to the success of the project. Then we moved on to the actual implementation of the repair. Here we can see that we cast from above the decks. We have the mixing procedure. After mixing, the UHPC was transferred using buckets and poured into the deck core holes using an inverted traffic cone to place the UHPC. This was a very effective method. Depending on the time that the UHPC was cast, heat curing was used. You can see the enclosures, and those were all heated to make sure that when we were casting during the winter, we didn't have any issues. Now we can see some of the completed repairs after form removal. The repair was incredibly successful, and this one of the key reasons was due to the mock-up. The contractor had not worked with UHPC before, but did a mock-up in their yard where they went through the mixing procedure, the material testing process, and the casting procedure in a mock-up that was a similar size and scale with the geometric complexities that they would face in the field. And this was really critical in, in a contractor that previously did not have UHPC experience conducting this project with really no concern. The casting procedure went incredibly well. To showcase the performance of the pairs, we collected a variety of data. And there's really two different ways that we show that the repair is functioning as designed. Uh, the first, if the UHVC panels are engaged, there should be a reduction in the magnitude of web strain under live load events. So before casting, we had really high magnitude strain events, and these are for three of the locations in which we monitored. Four days after casting, once that UHPC is beginning to gain strength, we see a reduction in those high magnitude strain events. And then 28 days after casting, once our UHPC has reached its full strength, we see the final condition where we have a really notable reduction in those high magnitude strain events. The other thing we can look at is the web strain UHPC and stud strain. Prior to repair, we would only see responses in our web strain. And after the repair, we would expect the UHPC to be activated. We'd be able to see some strain in the UHPC as well as some strain in the studs. And that's exactly what we see here. We have our web strain, which is the black curve. And then we have corresponding spikes from truck wheel loads in the UHPC and studs. With that, the main conclusions was that we successfully implemented the UHPC repair on a bridge in Connecticut. The repair successfully generated an alternate load path through the headed shear studs into the UHPC panel for shear and bearing forces. So this is a feasible repair option to extend the service life of bridges. And this was really a successful example of, of how the state contractor and the research team could work together and successfully deliver a project of a new repair method. And I just wanted to take the time to thank our partners at the Connecticut Department of Transportation um, in the research group, as well as the, the engineers from CTDOT that we couldn't have done this without, 
our partners at GM2 who worked on the design and, and CHA that were with us throughout the project. So Mike and Tom from CHA. And I can't thank Mohawk Northeast enough for, for their help having the, the contractor be on board and be able to provide us access when we needed it was instrumental to the success. With that, I'll be happy to see you in the poster session if you have any additional questions.